after the Georgia game, we came on here and we're asking ourselves, gosh, that was all bad. What was the worst part? But now after Oregon's big win against BYU, we get to ask ourselves a different question. Man, that was good. What was the best part? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That time once again for a Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thanks for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Like, comment, and subscribe, please, wherever you're listening to or watching the show. Thank you to everybody out there who has done so already. And we're getting uh, some live action, or I guess a post-live reaction here from uh, Ryan Winter, who was down in Eugene at Autzen on Saturday to witness what was a truly fantastic, very awesome, good, positive, uplifting, encouraging, hopeful, other positive adjectives to describe that football game against the Cougars. Ryan, great to talk to you as always. And the mood right now among Stuck fans, pretty high at the moment. And how could it not be? Yeah, it feels great, man. I, that game, again, I, I was like try to put a historian's touch on it and try to compare and contrast or whatever. And I think it might be a top 10 game at Austin that I've ever been to. I mean, it was the energy in the stadium was just different. This coaching staff, new coaching staff, this is the biggest win of their run so far. It really meant something. There was all sorts of other sort of behind the scenes tension or whatever caused up by all sorts of rhetoric on both sides a little bit going into this game. It just was running hot. And BYU looked at this as an opportunity this year, it felt like, to be a real magical season. And this would be a big game for them on that path. And uh, Oregon came out, and you said it best right before we started. Oregon basically utah them the way that utah utah at Oregon last year. Just completely dominated them. I mean, it never felt like they were in it for a second. You know, there were bits and pieces where their offense was clicking and whatnot. And you would expect that. It's a great quarterback and a really good offense. and. And just, but I just thought that the Ducks defense was much faster. The Ducks offense the skill guys were much faster. They were quicker to the ball. They were more explosive. You know, they were trying to run around the outside for the Ducks defense. Ducks were swarming yesterday. So just really impressed with the Ducks showing up, having a great game, beautiful day at Autzen. Couldn't ask for more. There were so many things that Oregon did right in this game and it was encouraging for me you know i I thought of it as a a barometer for the ducks for the rest of the season to see you know how do you measure up against a team that's comparable to the competition we'll face for the rest of the year and you know now you've had a couple games under your belt as an offense and as a coaching staff and you're starting to you know kind of get a feel for what this team is about and how they want to play football and and how they can make adjustments as well there were a lot of encouraging things and we're going to get to as many as we can here on the show today. Ryan, what was the biggest thing to you that that stood out as, you know, leaving you optimistic about where this team could go in, in 2022, if there was just one thing? I mean, I, yeah, there's there's a lot of them. You know, I, I would actually choose the two things. One, I just thought they just were so good on fourth down, both sides of the ball, right? They they won their battles. They were 3-0. and They had the freshman running the ball on th- fourth down, which was absolutely amazing to me. Um, and then on defense, they were shutting those guys down. You know, they, they they went 0 for 4. So I just – that was the stat of the game there. But I just really liked how creative Kenny Dillingham's offense was. It felt like this was the chance to finally see what the offense was. You know, the, the Georgia game, I don't know if, you know, they were playing, you know, uh, I don't know, more vanilla, whatever the term may be. But, you know, knowing that you just have – you're up against it with – Georgia and there's not much you can do against them you're going to try to take advantage of whatever they're going to give you but they're not going to give you much and I think that BYU there was some chances they were going to take because they just saw on film they can take advantage of some things and they said it after the game they said they ran multiple plays over and over and over Uh, they really simplified it I know you're a Chip Kelly uh, disciple of that era I am as well we both love the fact that Chip would run that same play over and over if it's working it's working make the other team stop before you stop yourself from running that same play and just just trying to keep it simple. I think that Bo running the ball really showed how good of an athlete he was, and, and, and they really kind of mixed it up a little bit. And 
the passing game kind of opened up for him because they were running the ball so well. So I was just really impressed with Dillingham's uh, offense in general. And then, uh, and the creativity of it, you know, running the 13 personnel, running the big heavy set, Patrick Herbert is a fullback. I mean, there was a lot of cool things that you saw there. Obviously going under center is just revolutionary alone and it's in of itself, especially on a third and one. Uh, but, you know, going for it on some of those fourth downs. And I just, I was really impressed with, the creativity of, uh, of Dillingham. The unit I, I was most confident in coming into the season, understandably, I think we all felt this way, was the offensive line. And they performed exceptionally well. They really have in all three games. I mean, Bo Nix wasn't under constant duress in the Georgia game. The Ducks ran the ball very well against the Bulldogs. Eastern Washington was an offensive explosion. And in this game, you converted every fourth and short. And a Byron Cardwell, by the way, for those of you wondering why he didn't see more action. That question is more well suited for Sean Dollars, who uh, was healthy, but Cardwell was not. He wanted to go, but the coaching staff held him out. And Jordan James, true freshman, stepped up. And that's not something that we necessarily expected, but credit to Lanning and Carlos Lachlan for having him ready for that moment. I mean, he converted a critical fourth down in that game, Ryan, in the Three execution. Yeah, he converted Three a couple. And yeah, we and saw. Yeah, no, jump in there, but yeah, I I I saw Byron Cardwell after the game, and you know, I, I asked him about not playing. He was like, "We're good, <laughs> we're good." And and and, and even uh, talking to uh, earlier in the week, uh, Bucky Irving during his media talked about how great this running back room gets along with each other, and how how the encouraging they are of each other, and everything else like that. There's a really deep room here, so use it. You know, you got a guy down, that's fine. Next man up. You know, they did the same thing with Justin Flo. You know, he he looked really good in warmups. I was really watching him. Uh, because the way that they warm up now, they, they really come to this other side. They, you know, our, my, the side that I my seats are on is the visitor side. Rarely would they always stay over there. They would usually kind of stay on their side. But now they're going on this side before the visitors are over there. And so I got to see these guys. They were really popping the pads before the game. They're really getting into it. I thought Flo was just going to be, you know, man among boys out there, but didn't play. And so I think, uh, you know, Jackson LaDuke, you know, other guys that came in, obviously, Keith Noah Brown. Barbosa, Keith Brown. You know, there's some guys in there who are going to get some good minutes. I mean, guys, there was a couple of really nice plays that LaDuke made up the middle. So you're right. I just think that you have to lean on the depth a little bit. And I think that's going to uh, obviously help you in the future. And I think we saw it on both sides of the ball. Bo Nix only completed 12 passes in this game, but was over 200 yards, a couple touchdowns. He ran for three. But I mean, I formations, quarterback sneaks. I think a lot of offensive coaches talk about at an introductory press conference or at media days or after practice interviews about wanting to be multiple, wanting to be versatile. I, I feel like Kenny Dillingham has discussed that and has really put that into practice so far in, in the games we've seen. I mean, those are formations we literally, I, I've literally never seen Oregon run that formation ever. Not even with my earliest Oregon football memories are probably Kellen Clemens you know, Kellen Clemens. Sure. But then after that, it was to Dennis Dixon in the spread. And then it was off and running from there. Everything was in the shotgun and Dillingham knows what he wants to do. And I, I think trusted that offensive line in key situations, the fourth down from the 30 yard line in the first half. I mean, that was, that was gutsy from Dan Lanning and company. Move, yeah. It really is. It's, you know, <laughs> big, big balls chip and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, yeah. It paid off, and those moments of execution that I talked about going into the game were were critical. The Ducks were almost flawless in, in the red zone for scoring touchdowns. Camden Lewis hit both of his field goals. They ran the ball really, really well. That helps in, in the red zone, too. But it just so many good things, and I, I want to finish on the offensive side of the ball before we switch over to the defense, which I was arguably more pleased with than uh, yes. than, than, the, than the offense. But first, I want to remind you all, Bet Online is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this week's games and beyond. Bet Online is also your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, Go Mariners, MMA, Boxing, and my personal favorite golf head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action bet online where the game starts so ryan the offense had explosive plays and again what i was just saying with kenny dillingham and actually you know walking the walk not just talking the talk at, at practice or media appearances or what what have you 
But one thing I remember when when he first got to Oregon was asked about his offensive philosophy. He said pro style offense. And that doesn't mean under center all the time. But what he described that as is getting guys into one on one situations. And we saw that early in the game, taking that downfield shot to Troy Franklin, who, man, <laughs> is he is he coming into his own or what? That was a heck of a catch. Great throw. I love the play. I, I love uh, the play call. I mean, Bo Nix had time to throw. He went through. He didn't force the ball anywhere. He didn't take a safe check down. He took a shot, trusted his guy could go make a play. Franklin did that. But that was just the case throughout. You know, there were these shot plays. Mottavau down the sideline. Ferguson's two touchdowns. I mean, it, it really does look like Dillingham as a first-time play caller. This was an impressive showing from him to be able to, to put up 41 points on a stingy BYU defense that's got a defensively-minded head coach. I think that was a really good game from, from Kenny Dillingham, and he did what he has talked about, and it was really effective on Saturday. I agree. I, I, I think that, you know, when I think of pro style, there's a couple of things I think of. Obviously, I used to think of the difference between shotgun and, and under center, but now everybody's doing shotgun in the pros. But right. I really I really think about it as, as the play action. You know, it, 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 how much play action are you getting? Are you sucking the linebackers up to the line and dumping it over the top of them? Um, how, how, are, how are you – creating a quarterback run that's not built in as an option play. I mean, there's a lot of different options and variables that you get out of the play action. And I do think that they're, they're leaning a little bit more on more creativity for Bo to, you know, kind of just get different looks from the defense and he was exploiting them. I mean, even uh, the zone read uh, on the, on his touchdown was really delayed. It was like, you know, he if take the ball to the, the running back and then like waited a couple seconds and then ran in like it was like a, a delayed draw kind of a thing. And I just, I think that that comes with playing. I think that comes with having a lot of expertise on the field, ha- taking a lot of snaps and, and, and playing a lot of football and the, a veteran player like that, you know, protects the ball in the goal line, you know, uh, Justin Herbert, you know, his, his sophomore year dove in on that play and broke his collarbone, you know, and, and, and you saw Bo uh, instead of diving into the thing, kind of turned his back to the defender and hit the guy with his back, protected the ball, you know, get, you know, it was a safe play for him and a leverage play, push the guy right out of the way, ran right in the end zone. So I think there's some things that, you know, you got to give credit to Bo when he's, when he's playing well. I think people are a little quick to be judgmental about him. And what we heard from Auburn right out of the gate was maybe a little bit more disgruntled with him than what was actually true. So we were hearing was so much of it is you're going to have the good Bo, the bad Bo and, you know, all this other sort of stuff. But I think you're actually going to see a little bit more of the good bow than the bad bow. Every quarterback makes mistakes. I just think that they might highlight his mistakes as more of a shortcoming because he's so athletic. And, you know, I always kind of think about comparing a, a running quarterback to a throwing quarterback, especially I see a lot of this in high school because you sometimes just put your best athlete back there at quarterback is, is really is, is how long do they let the play develop? I think that's the biggest difference between the, the, the pocket passer and the running quarterback, because the pocket passer is going to go through the checkdowns. It's going to let the play develop. He's going to be able to go to the deep ball because he allows the guy to run down the field. He allows time to run down the field versus the the, the, the guy who's the runner. The runner is going to go quick out of his hands, slants, movement, out of, out of screen passes, whatever. And as soon as the play is moving, if it's not there, it's not open, he's going to tuck and go. And I think Bo has been both of those players. And, and I think that when he does well, people are like, wow, Bo can really manage the game and throw the ball and do all these other kind of things. And he puts the, you know, this and the other. And when he does bad, they're like, well, he's just a running quarterback. That's just a running back playing quarterback. And, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's a tough position for those guys, as opposed to just a pure pocket passer. You don't even expect him to run. Tom Brady's got like three first downs running the ball in his whole career or something, you know, <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> some sort of thing like that. Right. It's just, but when you are when you're a mobile quarterback, I think that it's easier to discredit them uh, in the passing game. So you got to make it easy on them. They didn't take that many deep chances, but the ones they did, they hit on. So he looks like a genius. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was really pleased with uh, Bo Nix, and I, I didn't feel like there were a lot of times, really, if any, where he broke the contain in the pocket when when he didn't need to, you know, or, or if the play wasn't designed to do that. And to me, that's encouraging because it, it shows me a couple things. Number one, that he's con- continuing 
to to want to get better and to take coaching from Kenny Dillingham and that offensive staff and continuing to grow because that was one of the knocks on him coming in. Oh, he bails on the pocket too early. Right. Right. That's the first thing it shows. The second thing is he trusts his offensive line. And why shouldn't he? No Stephen Jones, Ryan Walk in and out of the game. Man, it didn't matter, Ryan. That unit was was dominant. And they ran the ball so phenomenally well, led by Bucky Irving. And before this, before the Georgia game, I, I came on here and said, think about Bucky Irving. Why would a guy who is the reigning all-purpose yards leader at Minnesota, a good Big Ten team, want to go to Oregon? And to me, I was like, I think this guy is going to be more involved than people think. And look, I like Sean Dollars. I like Byron Cardwell. I like all the backs frankly, but man, Bucky Irving in this game showed something that none of them had. I almost felt Ryan. I wonder if you think this too. He's like a mixture of CJ Verdell and Travis Dye. I think he brings that physical downhill style that Verdell had while also bringing in the shiftiness and elusiveness and agility that Travis Dye had. I think he's a mix of those two. And rather than having two styles, he, he provides that. And then you can keep him fresh throughout the game because you have so much talent behind him. I'm totally fine if we see four or five running backs for the rest of the year, play the hot hand. Maybe one time it'll be Whittington who ran well. Maybe Dollars will have a big game. I don't know. I don't really care because whatever they're doing so far is working, and it's important to remember that. And that's what he said uh, this week in the media availability. He said that exact same thing. He says the best thing about what they've got going on is they're fresh. Whoever's out there is fresh. You just go for it. You can rip it. What I really liked was his you know, just ability to bounce – through the play and extend the play and not get tackled and be creative and continue to lead downfield. You know, he, he gained a lot of pl uh, yardage after first contact. And that's always kind of one of those things you look at in the stat sheet and what, you know, stats can be kind of deceiving sometimes. So you get a guy like him who he had some really quality carries. He talked about also in the media availability that he does need to get better at catching the ball in the backfield. He has some drops this year. But the thing about him is, is that he, like you said, he's that blend. He's that really carbon copy version of what you want from a running back. A guy who's strong, he's balanced, balanced, exactly. And just can really do a lot of things. He's shifty, a little bit of a scat back, a little bit of a power back, beautiful blend. And, you know, I, I would also say Noah Whittington has a unique blend with that too. He's a little bit smaller, but uh, uh, just explosive in the hole and, it seems like on first contact, there's the play is still developing. And uh, for offensive linemen, you love that because, you know, there's so many different plays to be able to be made. You know, you could you could uh, get your first in interaction with the first defensive lineman. All of a sudden, the running back kind of bounces behind you. Now you're down on second level and you're hitting on a, uh, you know, linebacker or a safety coming up to crash the line or whatever else. So there's just so many opportunities to be made. And I think the creativity of this offense is really cool that they're providing for that. I also loved that they were going to go out like Stanford used to with the heavy package and tell everybody in the world that we're running the ball. Where are we going to run? Behind these six offensive linemen on one side of the, you know, I mean, that, that to me is fantastic because part of football is line up your best players against our best, our best players and let's see who can do this thing. It's like the opposite of like a rope pull. You know, it's just like the idea of like, let's just line them up and see what we got going. I love that attitude. And I also really like the energy they had in the shout. Uh, you know, Noah Sewell said something really interesting in his post-game interview when uh, Zach Neal asked him, <laughs> Zach said, hey, are, can, as being a leader on this team, uh, how can you help Dan Lanning uh, when you he tries to try yeah. to get out of the third <laughs> quarter into the fourth quarter? And Noah said, help him. He said, are you, he said, are, are you a part of that? He says, he says, no. He says, I'm trying to get him to dance with us. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's it's all good fun when, when you're up 38 to 7 on the then 12th ranked team in the country. But Lanning was asked about it. And I think he has, a, you know, he loves the energy too. Sure. But he also had the mindset of like, you know what we did in the first play of the fourth quarter? We allowed a third down conversion. Just and he's a gotta huge kind of balance play. It. Just a huge play. Yeah. And we've seen that in the past. I mean, I, I've gone to games at Otson for dang near 20 years straight. So it's like, you know, we've seen that in the past. We've seen going out of shout and it's like, uh-oh. But, but 
it's worth it. I think the, the, the environment around it was so great. And that's one of the best shouts we've had for a while because you can dance and celebrate a victory, but it's rare to celebrate this type of a victory. We don't get that many chances to have a top 25 opponent. And even if BYU is overrated at 12, they're still a top 25 team. They're still a top 20 team, easy top 15 probably. But the ideology is, is that to have that shout come at a time where you're kicking their ass. I mean, they came back and scored 13 points in the fourth. Up to that point, you're just completely working them. And you got a great situation there. So why the hell wouldn't you celebrate? These are college kids. I think we make it too stuffy a little bit for them to try to get into the tweed jacket a little early, you know. Just let them have fun, you know. And so uh, the environment was great. Uh, the BYU crowd did not have as much fun with Shout. There are some There are some fan bases that kind of get into it. <laughs> I wonder it. why. Even, even if they're getting drilled, though. I've seen fan bases. I've seen Arizona, Arizona State fan bases. They're dancing and singing or whatever. They don't care. Uh, but, dude, uh, no, BYU was a little tight. And nice people. There was some really good interaction. Of course, I always like to try to be uh, gracious when they come and try to talk to say hello to them and everything. But uh, there, you could tell there was some seriously frustrated people because they thought they were going to come in and get this vic victory. And, and it wasn't until about the second, third quarter that they realized they weren't. I love the energy from Shout. I found a YouTube video of it. It was so awesome it was I, I i wish i could have been there uh i promise all of you that after um i was actually simultaneously doing play-by-play -play for a volleyball match while the game was happening so i'm like calling the match watching the oregon game call the match watch i was it was just it was just going back and forth yeah not something i could have done if it was my first broadcast thankfully uh it, it was not but when that game ended like all of you, I was so fired up and I was blasting shouting my car all the way home. I've got the Oregon flag on my car all week long. That is all I might keep it there the entire month. I, I'm in Utah for those of you I who know. forgot. Oh, you're in the Lions. I'm mouth. writing, I'm writing the heart of it. Like I was so <laughs> fired up for all of this. My excitement could not be contained. I had my windows down. I was shouting with my hands like up out of my uh, sunroof and a window while I was driving back to to my house. And I, I really hope my mom's not watching or listening to this because she'll go nuts that I took my hands off the steering wheel, tended to it all times. <laughs> <laughs> the excitement level was, 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 was just too high. One thing that got me really excited in this game, Ryan, was what I felt like was the arrival, more so than Eastern Washington because of the opponent and, frankly, the way they played at times of the defense, the defense that we've kind of waited for. We saw what it could be, whether they can do it for the next nine games of Pac-12 play. That remains to be seen. But that was a really good glimpse of what this defense is capable of being. Christian Gonzalez was awesome. It was a really good day for guys that I've hyped up here on the show which gave me a little, a shred of satisfaction, not going to lie. Christian Gonzalez was awesome. Jeffrey Bossa made a bunch of plays. Terrence Ferguson offensively was an absolute stud. But the defense played such a well-rounded game. And, and that's really what was so satisfying for me. It was a big win for Oregon, but it wasn't just because of the offense. It wasn't just because of the defense. Both yeah. sides of the ball, Oregon dominated BYU, and that's why it was so impressive. Yeah, and special teams. I think I think Oregon did a great job. With, like, you talk about the kicking game. I mean, BYU missed a field goal. And, you know, to think about uh, the defense, you know, I just – I love to start with the trenches, obviously. And my favorite guy on the defense is DJ Johnson just because he's a guy who oh, has a, a relationship. He was a beast. Dude, yeah. I just – I've had a relationship with so long. Some of these guys, you know, with that extra COVID year, it feels like they've been here for so long, like – since my, since my son was in middle school, you know, now my son's in high school. And, uh, but, you know, DJ is just a great guy. And uh, I just really hope the best for him this year. Gets two solo tackles, gets six tackles. But, man, my favorite play he made was rush from the complete on the right-hand side all the way around. Looked like he blew up two or three guys on his way. Rush all the way around and then made the tackle for, like, you know, maybe a two-yard gain or whatever. A combo tackle with a bunch of other guys. But, um, you know, ducks are flying around and the, they're flocking around to the ball. I really love that. Uh, you know, early in the game, they went right through the middle. They tried to run the ball. LeDuc just stuffed these guys right in the middle. And I just love Jackson. I got a chance to talk with his family on the way in for about 15 minutes. 
and just such a great family. And, you know, Jackson came in with that same recruiting class that Noah and Justin did. And, you know, they're just that idea that those were such great linebackers. And then obviously you, you add other guys into that mix, these younger guys. And, you know, Keith Brown was really impressive to me. Uh, a guy yes, who, you know, yes, we knew was. what you're going to have, knew what you're going to have. I mean, he was the player of the year in Oregon as a senior when he was 11 and you know, you knew what you were going to have. He stepped in, played great Ohio State last year as a true freshman, week two. So, you know, these guys are just studs. And I just love – another guy who I absolutely love is Bennett Williams, a guy who I've had on my show numerous times. Absolutely st- great guy. Anytime I text him, he texts me right back. Just like super, super quality, quality individuals. And really smart and in the right place at the right time. And makes good plays and keeps the plays in front of him. Now, Triquez got burned a little bit. They were kind of on him in the broadcast a little bit. I rewatched the broadcast this morning. They were on him a little bit there because it was kind of obvious he was getting burned a couple times, but he's a guy who's continuing to learn as well. Smart guy, but he's a guy who I think will develop into being a really, really good player for the Ducks at that position. But Jamal played a great game. Steve Stevens played a great game. These are guys that you expect because they're such veteran guys. Dante Manning played really well. You know, he got that one penalty. It was right in front of me in the corner of the end zone. Uh, and, and, and it was just a terrible penalty that allowed them to keep going and get that touchdown at the end. And then right afterward, they went back at it after that. And they got him. And, and then he blocked the ball. You know, he was just so pumped up. You could tell his energy level was such a max high because these guys really test themselves to be the very best they can be. And, you know, I just I really love that on the outside. Mace Foon, I thought, played a great game. We love Mace in this house. And again, of course, Noah. You know, I don't think Noah needs to have the huge amount of tackles this year. Last year, he had to do a lot. Last year, he was in almost every single play. He was around every single ball. Because he had to be. Because he had to be a lot of times. He had to be. There was nobody else in that linebacker core. There was nobody else in that room. Everybody else was injured for the most part. And and he he was just drained after those games. There was literally nothing left after those games because he's a warrior. He will literally lay it all on the field. And you saw how excited he was at the beginning of the year. And then by the end of the year, those Utah games, it really took it out of him, man. And, uh, you know, those games are personal, uh, you know, against them, those guys. So uh, I thought the play of the day, though, was the Spencer Webb flag and Kinsley coming out with that. Yeah. I thought that move was just so epic. It gave them a chance, super classy. Yeah. And it gave them a chance to kind of have that moment on the field with Kinsley and Noah together. And I mean, it damn near brought me to tears, man. I thought that was just an awesome moment. And, uh, and I think there's going to be cool things like that this year where, you know, just like they did with Utah, uh, you know, where, you know, the kind of the, 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 the conference came together to support that Utah team through their tragedy. Uh, I think they're going to do the same. The rest of the conference is going to do the same for Oregon this year. Yeah, it's a it's a chance for it to be a great reminder of what we're doing. And Dan Lanning talked about it when when he was asked the question about shout. He said, "You know, football's supposed to be fun. Yes, at the, at the end of the day, that. that's what we're doing, right? Football is supposed to be fun, and it's supposed to have that communal impact. Uh, you know, where, wherever you are, whatever state you're you're in. But uh, you know, the defense, I, I thought." was so much more disciplined in their assignments. They didn't lose outside contain. I don't think they ever lost outside contain. DJ Johnson was setting the edge in the running game like I've never seen him do before. Bennett Williams was everywhere coming down from the secondary. Bossa was flying around. Uh, you know, Dorless made a couple of plays, one half tackles for loss, half a sack. There were a lot of things to like on the defense. Only concern really is the corner opposite of Christian Gonzalez. They're clearly trying to figure out who that is, and they don't know. Right. But Gonzo, but I, man, that was that's a true number one corner right there. The I, I agree. I agree. And, and and it would be remiss to, to leave out the defensive line because they are the they are the the heroes who don't always wear capes, right? I think Jordan Riley did a great job. Okay. Casey think, Rogers was dude, great. So good. And I think that again, those. Those, the, those transfers that come in, big body guys who've been in programs, who are mature, you know, they they really show up. And that's kind of what I thought BYU was going to have more of was those type of guys they didn't. Uh, and uh, that they, they made a big difference on the defensive line. Yeah, I, I am, I'm with you there. And you make a great point as well that the impact of a defensive lineman who are, and they're filling the shoes of Popo Amavai. 
by yes. the way, like that, that was a legitimate concern going in is like, how are these guys going to perform? Jordan Riley had a sack Casey yeah. Rogers set up Brandon Doyle's for that fourth and two stop by yeah. blowing up the play. Like there are a lot of things you could look at that are really, really encouraging. And so I, I love the the performance that was, uh, that was put out there by the ducks on the defensive side. Cause you bring in Dan Lanning, Tosh Lupoy, guys who have won national championships as defensive coordinators. And you say, yeah, I expect the defense to be a lot better. And that's what, if it looks like that every week, Oregon is going to be a really tough team to beat. That's not a guarantee that it will, but knowing that that's what it's capable of, I think that's the standard we we got to hold it to. We got to get agree. out of here. Yeah, go, you go yeah. ahead real quick. No, I, I agree. I think that was what was disappointing about the Georgia game, right? Because yeah. you didn't think that Georgia was just going to run all over your defense. You thought your defense was going to keep you in it at least a little bit. So the fact that they've rebounded from there and they've kind of stepped up in this game, Going forward, though, they're going to have their hands full. The Pac-12 scores a lot of points. Yeah, and we'll be getting to that all throughout the week. And the Pac-12 is looking a lot stronger right now than it did when the season started. Oregon State, Washington most notably. Uh, you can go check out all my commentary on that on uh, Locked On Pac-12 every day all throughout the week. Uh, but one more thing, uh, Ryan, and you're free to chime in here, but I got a, a somewhat unique mailbag question. This is from Grant Hag, who's asked me, a uh, question before he said happy game day spencer go ducks question for the lod mailbag did you or do you still play any musical instruments or sing based on the intro music to the podcast i'm thinking you may be a saxophone player thanks man um to answer your question grant i was a piano player until i was 10 i no longer play i cannot read music but my fingers do know how to move on the keys I taught myself via YouTube a couple of uh, Bo Burnham songs when I was in college because this rec room had a, a keyboard in there. But um, I am not a singer. You don't ever want to hear me sing. No one needs to hear me <laughs> sing, and no one ever will hear me sing. I, do you have any musical inclination, Ryan? No, I love music. L- listen to music. But no, no, I'm not a... Yeah, I, I, I no, I, 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 I've played around with a bunch of things. I remember trying to play this saxophone one more, one time, and it couldn't even make a, a noise. <laughs> yeah, I blew so, into it. It was so like, I thought this like made beautiful sounds when you played it. <laughs> it does, it does when, you, when, when you know how to play it. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, mu- music is not uh, not my forte. I do listen to, I listen to a lot of uh, classic music, a lot of Billy Joel and Elton John. That's kind of my, okay. that's that's my wheelhouse for, for music. But okay. that's going right. to do it for us today. Ryan Winner at Sports Chat 503 on YouTube and on Twitter. We are going to be doing a live show together on Tuesday night, 5 p.m. Pacific time on his YouTube channel. We'll be going in uh, the long form there. But Ryan, always appreciate your thoughts. And man, uh, appreciate you bringing back a, a W from Watson and reporting back here on the show because, man, that was that was one heck of a fun day, wasn't it? It really was. And uh, hopefully we have more to come in the future at Watson Stadium. <laughs> we certainly hope so. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.